Hello, world. Welcome back to Golf Subpar and happy 4th of July, everyone. It's Colt Nost and Drew Stoltz. Sleaze, the golf world just became much better. Ricky Fowler, been playing some great golf, but has been able to unable to cross the finish line. Well, that changed this week up in Detroit at the Rocket Mortgage Classic, where he picked up his sixth PGA Tour win. First one in over four years. The crowd was going absolutely insane. He got the job done in a playoff over Colin Morikawa and Adam Hadwin. Man, I'm excited. That was so much fun to watch. It don't matter if it's Southern California at the U.S. Open or Detroit, Michigan, apparently. Uh, it's Ricky's world right now. When he's in contention, uh, if you're not named Ricky Fowler, you ain't going to be getting a lot of cheers or a lot of rooting for you. That shot he hit on the 72nd hole, the end of regulation, place went nuts. There were some great shots of just the fans reacting to that shot. And, man, what an enormous, enormous shot that is for Ricky Fowler, just in his career and the narrative around him. Because, like, if he hadn't done that and hadn't made birdie on the 72nd to get into that playoff, We'd be sitting here talking about, man, Ricky, close again, playing some good golf, just can't get over the hump. And now all that's put to bed. And you saw just his reaction after he made that putt on the first playoff hole. Most people fist bump, you know, fist pump, do all kinds of crazy stuff. He just like looked up at the sky like, thank God. Thank God this is over. I don't have to talk about it. I've won. I've made. I've completed the comeback. Now we can just go on to trying to win major championships. And he's looking pretty damn good for that Ryder Cup too, Cole. Yeah, it was just it was a massive exhale. Um, he, if you look back, it feels like pretty much every tournament over the last several months, he's had a chance to win and just has really not got the job done on Sundays. You go to the U S open, he shot 75 here. He was in control the entire time on Sunday. It seemed like, and then all of a sudden the three putt for par at 14, not getting it up and down on 17, which everyone was birding, but Hey, he had to birdie 18 to have any chance at all of getting in that playoff. And he went out there, tugged his drive a little bit, but it ended up staying in the first cut. And then he knew, look, there's one option here. It's for me to go right at it. I got to make birdie if I want any chance. And he did it. And I would have to think all the work that he's done with Butch Harmon is now validated. They have busted their ass and finally, you know, got that win after over four years of a winless drought where he was down to over 185 in the world. Now up to number 23. And honestly, like over the last six months, he's probably if you were just going to rank the guys over the past six months, he's, he's a top 10 player in the world. He has played that good. In 20 events this year, he's made 18 cuts. He has 15 top 25s, eight top 10s, and a win. Like, he just he's there every single time. 15 top 25s, I think, is unbelievable, along with the only two missed cuts. If you rewind like a year or two ago, it was like, is Ricky going to be able to stay on the PGA Tour or things like that? Now we're talking about Ryder Cup, major championships. He just almost won in L.A., and it's just insane. Like, his reach on the game, whether you want to say it's justified or unjustified, but like he's a monster dude he won this golf tournament Lil Wayne is tweeting about him you know how many guys in the world you got like Lil Wayne who's a worldwide figure calling him his slime all this type of stuff like Ricky moves the needle unlike you know a lot of people and he's handled this slump better than anyone in the history of golf never freaked out on a reporter you don't see any club slams any tantrums out there which easily he could have done it just takes one bad moment or one question that you're sick of answering and you kind of freak out and boom it's all over the internet never done it once uh, you saw, I mean, I think it speaks volumes, Colt. He rolls in that putt on the playoff hole. You can see in the background, Adam Adams like clapping as that thing goes in. I'm sure he's gutted for not winning that thing, but like everyone was kind of rooting for this in some capacity, I think, just because they know what Rick's gone through. And not only that, the way he's handled it too. Just a, just a monster. Can't say enough good things about him. One of the nicest guys I've ever met in my life, Ricky Fowler. Always says the right thing, always does the right thing. Um, even, you know, when nobody else sees it. He's there helping people out, signs every single autograph. Class act, Ricky Fowler, congratulations. I know the entire golf world is extremely happy for you. Uh, Sleaze, it was quite the week for me. Last time we spoke, I was getting ready for my little birthday celebration in New York City. A couple incredible rounds of golf at Friars Head and Liberty National. Can't thank those guys enough for allowing us to come out. We had an absolute time. The golf wasn't that great, but uh, the rest of the time was, and it led right over into... Two nights of Morgan Wallen, Ford Field in Detroit. The place was rocking. I mean, it's going to be hard for me to ever top that birthday week. I don't even like to say birthday week. I, I, I tell everybody you get a day, but it just seemed like everybody wanted to keep celebrating me, so I allowed them to. Oh, everybody else wanted to celebrate <laughs> that big day. Yeah, you were only 37 last time I talked to you, dude. Now you're 38. You're growing up right before our very eyes. Friars head, dude. One of the best in the world. It, for on on the sleeves rankings, that thing's top five. It is, it is so damn good. There's so many good ones up there. 
it doesn't get overshadowed, but like the Shinnecocks and the things like that, the Nationals, which are also spectacular. But Friars Head just different, man. It's, it's like almost a best of Coors Crenshaw. And it doesn't just kick your head in like some of those other places. It's hard. It's world class golf, but it's also just fun. Uh, it's one of the best places in the world. That's a that's a hell of a hell of a spot to get the post up for the big for the big three eight. It was it was awesome, man. Also, shout out to Franklin Hills Country Club in outside of Detroit. I had a chance to go over there and play unbelievable golf course if you're ever up there i'd never heard of it and i was blown away at how good this place was as pure as it comes so much fun so if you, that's another one if you ever get up there in that area you got to check that one off your list so much fun yeah there's a lot of good golf up there in michigan even the places you haven't heard of you show up you're like dude this place is sick and this is because it's surrounded by great golf too and i tell you what when i showed up they were like man you look really nice today in your rlx polo of course as dude. do you blind Exactly. We're wearing the best in the business, and the RLX Golf Collection draws inspiration from the traditional aesthetic of polo, updating it to create a modern sensibility focused on performance-driven design. From sophisticated styles to the most technologically advanced fabrics available, RLX Golf is the ultimate in functional luxury and provides pieces that are ready for whatever the conditions bring on the course or off. Look good, play good, play bad, look good. It's a simple rule we, we go by here at Subpar. Ralph Lauren is the official outfitter of the United States Ryder Cup team and partner of the AJGA. Ralph Lauren is proud to continue its sponsorship of golf ambassadors Andrea Lee, Billy Horschel, Davis Love III, Devin Bling, Doc Redman, Jonathan Bird, Nick Watney, Sean Foley, Smiley Kaufman, Todd Anderson, Tom Watson, Trevor Werblow, Troy Taylor III, Tyler Strafacci, and Zach Johnson. The RLX Golf Collection is available in select Ralph Lauren stores, exclusive private clubs and resorts and online at ralphlauren.com go get yours today as always we're rocking our RL rlx and this stud of a horse right here of course dude sophisticated gear for sophisticated people which leads us directly into our next guest Cole, who i would say sophisticated i mean other than i mean barely ahead of gary woodland on the smartness scale it's close it's a toss-up we're gonna have to get him in there have him take the sat Something like that to really figure this thing out. But yeah, he's as close as there is, I would say. All right. Well, he's the head man over at Ping, designing all those incredible golf clubs. Let's get to it. I mean, he's got a mechanical engineering background. So basically, we know nothing about what he's about to talk about, but it is fascinating. Here's Marty Jertson on Subpar. All right, folks. Today, big day for us here today. Our first ever Colt mechanical engineering major on the show. Haven't had any of those. And if you're a guy who's ever hit a ping golf club, uh, there's a good chance this man designed it right here. He's VP of fitting and performance at ping. He's a genius. Also, as you see the shirt, co-founder of the stack system, which we're going to talk a lot about. His name, Marty Jertson. Marty. Dude. The Jerty Bird. Thank you, boys, for having me. It's going to be fun. Good to, good to have you, my man. Three geniuses, one podcast. What could go wrong? <laughs> I was just thinking, Colt, we've had some... We've had some really, really smart people on the show. Uh, Gary Woodland, Brandon Stokely come to mind. I think this <laughs> there might be the new smartest guy. Those two might have just got bumped. I was going to say, we've covered the entire spectrum. I was going to say Gary, and now Marty Jertson. <laughs> I had to throw yep. in Stoke, too. I was like, I don't want to solely drag Gary. I'll throw in no, one it's of my fine. idiots as well. But Marty, That's thanks up. so much for joining us. Uh, let's talk a little about your, you know, your know, how you got into the game of the golf. I believe Colorado School of Mines correct that's right what what is their mascot the miners i'm guessing uh or diggers like the or diggers or diggers yeah dude they're up in the mountains that's, exactly it's a very you need a big brain to go to mines but talk to us yeah. just about how you got involved in the game of golf and what led you obviously to ending up at ping yeah so i i grew up in globe arizona which is a mining town and my parents were like hey you know all the uh well, these people in Globe went to the Colorado School of Mines because they're it's a mining school. That's what you know, it's what the school's all about. And I was never quite good enough to be like a D one player. You know, I was always losing to uh you know, Chez and, and Charlie and Mueller and <laughs> I could never beat those guys. So yep. I was like, Well, I'm gonna go to school to go to school and not play golf. And uh and so yeah, I ended up at the school of mines and that's an awesome school. They got a great golf program now. Uh, credit to Tyler Kimball up there. Um, Jim Canals. Jimmy. Yeah, Jim, Jimmy. Jimmy Hard K. Mm -hmm. Jimmy yeah, Hard K went to the School of Mines. Yeah. Um, and we got some good kids out playing the mini tours now that I'm sure we're going to make their way on tour. 
here shortly. So yeah, it was awesome, man, going to school up there. But it, you know, when I went there, it was uh, kind of play golf casually a little bit, and I skied. And I mean, the school was really hard. Like you graduate from there, it's like survival mode, man. But I got a little bit better uh, when I was playing up there, like in the summertime. You know, played in the pub links, and uh, that Ches actually won in San Antonio, and then I won to Colorado State Am. Beat Stads, you know, yes. in the state am. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about it, that. Stads. Hold on, hold on. You suck <laughs> that, Kev. Sorry about it, Kevin Stadler. <laughs> Where was that? That was at uh, Saddle Rock. Yeah, I think I went. Yeah, I went at Saddle Rock back in the day. That's beautiful. Oh yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. So you know, and- so uh, rumor has it Stads was just super positive Tony Robbins until you beat him that day. <laughs> <laughs> He used to just float around the course yeah. until you were doing oh, Marty dude. took his soul from so, him. He never recovered. But I was just like, oh, man, I just started overachieving a little bit. But, you know, and then when I graduated from there, I was like, well, I'll play the mini tours. And and uh, I think I made a very smart decision and quit very fast, man. Like one year out there, failed at Q school. Yeah, you know, I played OK in the Gateway Tour and all that stuff. But uh, got right into ping, man. And uh, for, through a friend of a friend, you guys know Ryan Hogue. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One, one of my best friends. He's caddied for me in a bunch of the big tournaments I've played in. And uh, he's the one who kind of got me connected into Ping. I just started working there full time, and I and I just loved it, man. I didn't, I didn't really think I would uh, use my engineering degree to like design clubs or do anything. That wasn't like my goal going into school. So I kind of just got lucky getting in there, and then um, I mean that's where the whole, the whole journey kind of started. Slight backtrack here because I mentioned mechanical engineering. It's a pretty specific major, yeah. tough major. When you do that, like the people you were in class with are they what are they are they building bridges and tunnels or like is that what you thought you were going to do i was going to ask how the golf came in obviously you were a golfer but yeah designing clubs is a little different that's a great question like you know because the golf industry is so niche you can't like go to school to learn how to design clubs like you got to learn on the job but most mechanical engineers at least went to my school man you would go out and work on an oil rig, you know, off the coast of Alaska or Texas or something, you know what I mean? Or yeah. my school is very oil and gas. So you either you go find it, geology, you learn how to get it out, you design the equipment to get it out, and you process it, you sell it. Um, but a lot of other mechanical engineers would do like uh, go into the automotive industry, work on cars, planes, aerospace, things of that, things of that nature. Aerospace. Give us the, the first yeah. golf club you ever designed. Uh, the Rapture Hybrid. Okay. Rapture Hybrid. I had yeah. it. I hit it. Hit it good as shit, by the way. Good club. It was a good club. And it left a lot, and I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't okay, have that so problem ha- anymore. <laughs> take me take me through that process. You're like, you're okay, you're gonna design a golf club and you all you decide a hybrid. How a hybrid of all things? Well, you know, it was, that was the early days of hybrids, yeah. man. So I, w- I was like, I studied under, we have this kind of like apprenticeship model. It, you know, it's because you can't learn in school. You got to kind of study under some of the other designers. So I would do like the uh, the grunt work, you know, make like the draw- the stuff that wasn't fun. You know, it, like make the drawings, make the instructions for the supplier and how to make it and things of that nature. And so the hybrid was like a good one to kind of ease my way into the design. But actually, that first one I did was super complicated. It had like this uh, tungsten blended sole plate design with some advanced manufacturing, this like high strength face. It was welded all over the place, had this kind of swoop back crown. So actually, even though it was a hybrid, seems like it might not be the most complex club to design. That one, (laughs) I started with actually kind of a challenging one. And hybrids um, were like brand new, kind of just coming on the scene. I yeah, remember they were that. brand they were new, kind of coming on the scene. When you look at that Rapture hybrid that you designed then, compared to like what Ping has now, are you like, oh my god? Yeah, like, is that like that was when we were in horseback and now we're in cars? I mean, a little bit, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it was cool. We designed because we needed to bend those on tour. I mean, those days the hybrids did go kind of left. We solved that problem now for the better player. But I designed these like molds where you could go take them in the tour truck and kind of yank them around, bend the line in the loft, and things of that nature. Hybrids kept me on tour a lot longer than I should have been. Yeah, this is the guy. 100%. Yeah. Man. I'm a hybrid guy. I played <laughs> back in college, I played a ping hybrid for sure. They're, but um, yeah, those things are lifesavers. If I had to hit a two iron, I would have been doing a podcast way sooner. Dude, Joaquin is hitting a five hybrid as his four iron. He's wow. placed five hybrid, five iron. I watched, and he loves that thing. I feel like just right now, like more of them are leaning into that three and four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't heard many fives, but. Three and four. Yeah, we talked well, to Joaquin. Yeah, and he was he was really funny. He was like, because it's such an ego thing for him. Yeah. He's like, where should I put it? Should I take my foreign out and put it in there? Should I put it with the woods? You know? Hide it. <laughs> hide it under your Exactly. Drive. At the U.S. Open, I was looking through Dustin Johnson's bag. He has a seven and a nine wood. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just shows, man. Cole, you know, man, you got to get that ball up in the air, man. Oh, you got to elevate and, that thing. But we got these 12 handicappers thinking it's cool to carry a two iron. I'm like, what are you guys yeah, doing? This game's so hard. Blades. Dude, those days are gone, yeah. man. Come if on. DJ can hit, then it's the then the stigma is gone. Exactly. You know what I mean, dude. if he walks in with a nine wood, like, yeah, give me one of them things. I play when I go to play the Colorado Open because the ball flies lower at elevation. I I put the five hybrid in as my four iron, and it's freaking awesome. Love it. So easy. There's yeah, no reason, honestly, there. not yeah. to have them. Three and four no. for every golfer, and yeah. then five probably for most. But it's like you hit a three iron, and then they're like, hey, hit this. Yep. Tell me which one. When you hit it shitty, you tell me which one's better, yeah. which you do most of the time. <laughs> you unless know, you most people, unless you live in Midland, Texas, where the average wind speed is like thirty-five miles an hour, you should not have a three iron. True. Yeah. yeah. True. Um, what do you think? I was gonna ask, go like, what do you think? Like the biggest, obviously, technology has changed so much in the game of golf over the last ever since you've been involved at Ping. What's the one thing that like people might not think of that has changed the game the most? Uh, like during what you're thinking like the last 10, 20 years, like technology wise, like something like, I mean, is it a shaft? Is it something in the head? Like people are now putting carbon in their driver heads. Like what, what is, what is one thing that people might not think of? I think it, it I think it's this, well, this technology came out where we could cast titanium really, really thin. And that allowed, like you think of the drivers getting big and 460 and having center gravities that are way back and being so forgiving. This manufacturing process is pretty cool. It's called centrifugal vacuum casting. I'll tell you about it later, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Film in later. I'll Film explain later. it later on the breakdown. But it's like, well, it's where you melt the titanium. I'm gonna kind of simplify here, but you melt the titanium and you you have the molds for your drivers in a big circular thing, and you suck all the air out of there. So it's like you take all the impurities out that could end up in the titanium, and the and all these parts are spinning really fast. And when you melt the titanium in, because there's no air in there. And because it's spinning, the titanium flows and gets pushed to the end through centrifugal force. And that allows us to make the, the wall thickness on your driver is like three pieces of paper thick. You know what I mean? It's like one hair, one, the diameter of your That's hair thin. Your hair, so not I mine. Think <laughs> damn near invisible <laughs> so that's been like i think like one of the big meta technologies that has allowed drivers to get big and wall thicknesses to get really thin it's so wild because like you know we were using i guess 20 years as our reference right it's like clubs have gotten so good if you look yeah. at just like the fir from the pro v era go back and look at what you i remember when the when the great big bertha came out i was like and i had it i got yeah. it and i was like cheating this is it's exactly. over. How can you ever not hit it far and good with this thing? Now you look at that and you're like, oh my god, that's an artifact. Yeah. How do you keep getting better? Like there has to be a limit at some point because the trampoline effect is only so much, right? So how do you keep getting better dude, on each release? Oh, dude, that's for, that is such a great question, man. Because I think that's one of the biggest things. I think most golfers think like, oh, manufacturers up against all these limits. How can you keep getting better, dude? We are working on so many research things that you can get better. You know, in working within the boundaries of the rules. So I'll give you a few examples. Like, you know, the ultimate goal is to make the driver go faster, right? Uh, or one of the goals is make the driver go faster. So a way to do that is you can make the driver perform aerodynamically better, right? Turbulator. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, well, how do you do that? There's no, like the USGA doesn't have a rule necessarily on like, uh, aerodynamics of the driver. They have a rule on like features. You can't put features in a certain place. But turbulate, we worked on turbulators to try to solve that to solve that problem with, to help you swing the driver faster, and it, it didn't. It worked within the boundaries of the rules, right? It's like getting two miles an hour club head speed for free. Another example right now, like on our G430 driver, is in, instead of making the driver more forgiving, because you you know we are working within like we're approaching the limits of forgiveness for, within the rules. We changed the face curvature because when you guys hit the driver thin. You know, it it launches low, it balloons. If you're playing in a crosswind, you're like, crap. You know what I mean? So we changed the uh, loft on the driver low on the face so that when you hit it thin, the spin stays the same as when you hit it in the middle. Mm. And it makes the driver act like it's 20% more forgiving than it actually is. Like we would have to make the MOI go up by 20% to get that level of like forgiveness. So you just keep like stacking these things that we got, we got more things coming down the pipe. You just kind of layer it on, layer it on, layer it on. And that's how we're continuing to like make clubs better. That 430 is sick. 
It was really sick. good. I feel yeah. like everybody using it. I went out to the ASU event, um, college event. Yeah. And I'm telling you, more than 50%. Yeah. We're playing that thing. Yeah, it's, it's not, qu- quite it's, often the, yeah. the number one model on uh, on tour. That thing's good. Yeah. Really, really yeah. good. The technology has just been wild. What was what was the reaction at Ping when the USG announces they're t- uh, proposing this rolling back of the ball? Yeah, it's a, that's a... Let's talk ball. This will be good combo. Yeah, yeah, that's a tricky one, man. I think I think all of us are, even even the tour players and even... even um, you know, a lot of the industry is like, you know, we're, we're kind of thinking about solving that problem for the top 0.1%. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I think we at Ping are very focused on helping the everyday golfer. And we're not, you know, I think however that's going to shake out, we've kind of put our, uh, our you know, official response out there in the form that you're allowed to do with the USGA to kind of consider the health of the game. I mean, the, the game is exploding. Like, let's all hunker down and and uh, and keep that momentum going you know what i mean and how realistic is it on like you're in the manufacturing industry you're a perfect guy to ask my argument for this is like okay let's say pj tour says that guys are hitting it too far dude we have a ball here's the rules that can only go whatever the specifications and the rules right yeah. but it's going to be way shorter basically yeah okay so they're going to go to the manufacturers i know ping's not a big ball manufacturer but like hey guys uh, you know that sweet ball you make that's really good yeah, we're gonna need to make you one. We're gonna need to make one that's just way shittier, by the way, and to just spend a bunch of money on the R and D. You're gonna need to produce this thing, yeah. and then also, by the way, you're not gonna sell it to anyone because nobody wants it. It's exactly. just for these guys. Yes. Hey, go ahead and do that. Somebody's gotta fund the R and D. Is you that know, gonna to make I mean, that golf ball? Is that realistic that that could be like? Is that what happens if PG? I don't think they're gonna ever do it. I'm on the record saying that. But if they did, yeah. like the manufacturers are gonna throw their arms up, and be like, "Are you out of your brain?" Yeah, I mean, somebody's gonna have to fund it. If there is a ball yeah. for the PGA Tour players, somebody's gotta pay for the R&D and manufacturing and all that stuff. So, and they don't I, sell it. Exactly. And then my point would be, yeah. tell me if you think this is true too. Let's say they do that, and somebody, if if the manufacturers fund it, somebody else, somebody's spending money, right? Yeah. I always thought it would be on the manufacturers to do it, but then like, what happens? All right, we're we're spending a bunch of money, we're making no money. All right, so make our other dozen balls that people actually do buy. That, that we got to recoup that. They're yeah. not just going to take L's. Yeah. That's not what they do. Yeah. So like a oh, dozen balls that goes up yeah. twenty five bucks a box. Yeah, I mean my my co founder at the Stack, Sasha McKenzie, he he, he kind of weighed in on this topic. Is that if you ro- if you do roll the ball back, you'll 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 make all the athletes on the PJ Tour. It's already happening a little bit, right? Cole is uh, in five to ten years they will figure out how to hit the ball back into that same spot. Like we're not even close. You know, everyone's going to be swinging in, in at 130 to 140 miles an hour. Like you got Martin Borgmeier and these guys swinging at 140, 150. Like the, the PJ tour play will have, will evolve into that to hit the ball that goes shorter back into the same spot we're hitting now. And you will eliminate having, the the shorter players even more from on the PGA Tour if you if you implement that ball rule I mean it's a really good kind of thought experiment to kind of think about it that way I think I'm just I, I'm interested to hear your your thoughts like because I'm so against bifurcation like I don't want the yeah. the people at home to play a different golf ball or equipment I think one thing that's really cool about the game of golf is the average dude can go out and buy the same clubs that you know one of your ping totally. staff tour players plays you, you you can't just show up at Fenway Park and go take batting practice like I think that's one of the things that makes golf really cool I love yeah no Cole I'm, I'm in the same boat man I totally agree it is cool you can look at the tour players you can look at what they're doing how they're playing golf the equipment they're using you can try to be like them man I'm I'm, I got, I'm of the same opinion yeah staying on that uh, I mean of all the guys you, you you've worked with some of the best players in the world who when they showed up that like maybe you hadn't spent that much time with was the most impressive Oh man, I think uh, I think Hunter in his Hunter in his heyday. Yeah, I mean, spending time watching him hit balls like literally never missed a shot. You know, on our staff, like Hunter uh, Westwood. Westwood is actually quite impressive when he was like around hanging around number one in the world from a ball striking standpoint. But I would say I would say H like his ball striking and yeah. watching him hit drivers, man, just perfect over and over during his prime was very impressive. I always thought when he was in his heyday, like nobody drove it better than him. Correct. Yeah. Like the for combined like distance and accuracy. Yeah. Uh it was it was sweet, man. I remember when when we launched the uh well actually it was the first time we showed any tour player turbulators. I flew out to Dallas National, went to the range. It's just me him our tour rep at the time uh and then Sean Foley. 
And and I showed him the driver with turbulators. And Sean Foley starts he starts looking at this thing. He's like, what are these things called? You know? And I was like, oh, those are turbulators. And then he starts busting out in this rap song about turbulators. turbulators mount wow. up. <laughs> Did you name them the turbulators? Is that no, you? No, it's, it's actually kind of semi, actually like the scientific <laughs> uh, correct name. But Hunter freaking was flushing that thing, man. Hunter didn't miss from like age 12 to age 40, yeah. basically. Yeah, not yeah. one shot. From hitting it out of the middle perspective. Yeah. Um, Bubba, I've heard some stories, because I was a ping guy, uh, in there. Like when he first, and you hadn't seen anybody, A, swinging it that oh, hard, yeah. and B, moving it. Like dude, like hitting his irons were like, I mean, like, yeah, aim at that flag. That's your target. And like none of them, they would start, you know. Oh, they're like, so we just fun. never. It's like he's messing around on the range, but that's actually but that's, how he plays. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. actually how he played. I mean, so, I mean. I think, uh, yeah, Bubba was very fun to watch. He was very unique to work with because his needs were so different than every other player. It kind of challenged us, you know, like his work, like how much he moved and worked the ball and how much he interacted with the ground and the size of his divots and things of that nature were like very unique for us to be able to uh, like optimize and build clubs for him. Yeah, he was one of my different. favorites to play with just because it was fascinating. Like, I, I don't feel like he knew which way he was going to curve it until right before he pulled the trigger like he would move exactly. back and forth and all of a sudden he's like okay i'm gonna hook this nine iron 30 yards oh yeah i mean this is amazing now i played a little bit of golf uh in a few majors i always played my practice rounds with miguel jimenez oh and i tell you what man may you know I, he didn't have that he didn't hit that far but he could hit his talk about high lofted fairy woods man he carried three five seven nine or whatever and we'd be out on a par a par three i'd be hitting like a five or six iron in there he'd pull out a wood and i swear to god he could hit his like seven wood closer his dispersion pattern was closer than my sand wedge like his fairway wood play is unbelievable that's like numb nuts over here exactly oh, we're going with numb nuts. Little number four <laughs> the number four hybrid when we're talking about gary yeah when he pulls that thing out i'm like i'd rather him hit be hitting six iron yeah without question exactly and that might, this is going to come in at it i might be putting a six hybrid in pretty soon the way i've been playing lately it's not good. We make them. We make covers. a seven hybrid. You Head know, covers. need one. You, you mentioned, call. Marty, you mentioned major championships. I believe you played in six. What are some of your yeah. takeaways? You made the, First off, you made the cut at Bethpage, so obviously you just wanted to torture yourself for two more days because that place <laughs> is just miserable to play. But what were some of your takeaways from your major championships? Oh, dude, it's freaking tough out there, man. I mean, the rough. People are like, oh, they just don't understand. Like, you can't even describe, like, how thick the rough is. You know what I mean? Like you hit it in the rough at, uh, I mean, wing foot. I played the wing foot in 2020, the major that literally had no fairways. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> and then Beth Page, man, you hit it in the rough. You're just like, oh man, just you just go ahead and give me the lob wedge or sand wedge, like walking off the tee box. Like it is the the rough is so penalizing out there. And actually, like I think in most tournaments, Colts, like you don't need to practice your 50 yard shot, but in the majors, you you actually do because you drive it down there. Uh, and then you hack it out of the rough and you're going to be like 50, 80 yards out to try to get it, try to get up and down. But yeah, the majors are, the, the majors are, uh, like, I think, you know, I played in Vegas, I played in the Phoenix open and in, in, in the Vegas event a handful of times, but I mean, the majors, even, even for the tour players, like it's the next level challenge. And then you put me or the club pros out there and the Michael blocks out there is, you know, uh, in, in trying to hang with those big boys. I think the key for me uh is the importance of driving like you got to drive that ball so good and that's why i did really good at beth page like especially those first two days i mean i putted good i had a, a couple good putting rounds but i finally kind of drove it like you needed to and in arizona golf like you just like you don't need to hit the driver that good per se like it's not a premium on that or even like corn fairy it's not just you know it's until you get to that level with yeah. those guys and yeah then you see is that the biggest like he has your takeaway like is that the big when you you're really really good you're plus four or five whatever you're pro yeah. you played in tournaments you're as good as people have seen before and then you go to that when you come away from that and you get your head kicked most of the time or you is it strictly the driver like from seven iron i'm fine i can hang with these guys but it's just i can't get it in i would say the number like one do. thing is like driving and it's like you got to hit it far and straight like you can't do one or the other like they, they both got to be down there man and that's why these the the kepkas and the djs of the world like dominating these majors is like the number one thing you got to do and then after that i think it's it's uh being able to hit your long irons high and stop them 
like and even at Beth Page, like those long par threes. And that's what I did from 18 to 19. I got way more speed. I hit my long irons high and far and I drove it really good. And I got more pop. You know, I was like 20 yards further when I played in 18 at Belle Reve to in 19 when I made the cut and played good at at uh at Beth Page was like getting more speed and driving the ball way better. Is that when, so we got to talk about stack. You got it on the shirt here. It's, this thing has exploded. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. The stack system, you, Dr. Sasha, um, basically get faster. Swing, do what everyone wants to do in golf. Get longer, hit it further. Totally. You created an actual system for it where you can track it yeah. and do all this stuff. Is that, A, is that when that, when you develop that, like, I got to drive it better if I want to play in these things? Yeah. And yes. B, just kind of talk about like conceptualizing that and taking it to market. Yeah, so that that was kind of my story. There is like I played in the I played in the PGA Championship in eighteen, and I would I would describe myself as sneaky short. Like I, I played with Luke Liss uh, and and Chappie. Uh, that make I mean they're gonna make you feel sneaky. But I played with Chappie in in the first two, those in the first two rounds. He or, started moving it crazy a handful of years ago. Yeah, he was hitting it really far, high and, all of a sudden. He yeah. used to hit it super low. And so then, it was like it was like me out there. At, 285 then it was chappy at 305 and then luke whatever you know like a mile down there and and i was like dude, that's when it like i had that aha moment like dude, i need to like change my game because i could get here again but i'm gonna fail again you know what i mean i and, and that was my that became like my mission um so that's where like the whole mission to like gain more speed and i think that's something i've done kind of in my career is try to productize solutions that have been like kind of needed for myself you know what i mean like a little bit of skin in the game and Sasha was doing this cool research. He helped me get stronger through like deadlifting protocol, this type of stuff. And he was doing this cool research. We were working with him on ping of doing like very specific over under training where it's like you need to have very specific loads and swing it. A, you know, Explain over under. Over under is uh, you, you, uh, you swing a certain percentage of your club head speed a little bit faster in a certain percentage of your club head speed a little bit slower. So like the whole concept of speed training, I think like sounds easy. Like, oh, I'm gonna speed train. Well, what in the world does that even mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like a mystery to it. It's not just swinging something like way heavier, way lighter. Sasho did the research to figure out, okay, we need, we need to have weights on the club that you can, you can have that's customized for you and you and me. All, all of our weight that we're gonna have is gonna be very different. Um, and swinging a certain percentage faster and slower. And if you do that in the right timing every like three or four days, you know, two or three days, and you do the right protocol of percentage over percentage under, you can unlock some like amazing speed gains. And this is totally different than like fitness. Like you, you got you got to be fit, you got to be strong, but then speed training is like a mutually exclusive skill that you want to mm -hmm. kind of marry those two things together. And yeah. that's where it all started, man. And and I worked on it and, and got faster and, and that helped power me to to doing good there in 19 with the uh with the stack system obviously y'all had a tremendous amount of success sold a gazillion of them talk about though i think i think the, the world really found out about it with matt fitzpatrick and yeah. what when he won yeah. the u.s open because like that was a guy who i said like no disrespect over four days he could contend with the best players in the world especially when the golf course was hard but like he would go to the Ryder cup and trying to play a singles match against dustin johnson or those guys in an 18 hole sprint like he got worn out because he was he was short and now this yeah. dude can get it over 180 miles an hour. All the time he's over 180. Like every time I watch it on TV, man, it's like 180, it's 182. Like long now. He's long. Went from like short-ish yeah. to long. Yeah. So like two years ago, two, two and a half years ago, he was uh, he could not break 170 ball speed. He's like stuck in the 160s, maybe even like mid-160s, go at one 168. Couldn't get over. And it's like... Pretty much literally the only thing he's done is exclusively train with the stack. Sasha's kind of helped him look at his data, kind of manage his, his training program and be a little bit more hands-on with it. But he literally uses like the exact same product, you know, you, you get in the algorithm. Um, and so he, he did it. He trained on the stack religiously for about a year and a half. So it wasn't like, hey, six weeks and, and, and off you go, which will get you a bump, but you got to keep investing in it. So he's... We've plotted his speed over the last like two years and you can go on data golf or whatever and look at this. His average driving distance just went like, just went do, 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 do. And he just kind of went going, uh, going up, going up. And he peaked right, right there, uh, about a, a, about a year ago now is when his ball speed really started to peak out. And he's, uh, you guys saw him at the U S open, man. He, he drove that green on the, 
on the par fours. The only guy that I think hit the green on that, that drivable par four. Um, and his ball speed is like incredible. So he's been amazing. We've got a ton of guys doing it. The two guys who've gained the most speed on the PJ tour last year were Matt Fitzpatrick and Victor Hovland. And they both, uh, use the stack in that process. That's sick. And you know, the cool thing about both of those guys and Victor, I never thought of as like slow, but I guess everybody wants more, obviously the way the game is going, but neither of those guys lost like any accuracy. It's not like Matt was this, Correct. You know what I mean? It wasn't totally. like, oh, now I hit it. I'm 20 no. further, but I missed two or three more fairways around. Then it's kind of like, all right, does it net out? But like both of this system, for whatever reason, I haven't used it. I'm excited to start using it now. Yep. But like, it doesn't seem like anyone gets more crooked, which sometimes when people are like, I'm just going to start swinging harder. Like, all right, yeah, maybe you do, but you're going to, if you lose one around, it's like, all right, well, it doesn't exactly. really net out. To exactly. And, and for me, like, I don't practice. I don't have a lot of time to practice. Dude. I got my job and run the stack, my family, all that stuff. I'm like, it's a really good way to get a lot of reps in and work on your mechanics. Like we were kind of talking about, if yeah. you want to work on some feels, some waggles, some swing things and not have the consequence of hitting the ball. It's actually kind of a, a cool uh, effect you get with the stack. Um, so, yeah, no, it's been amazing, man. We have like close to 25,000 people doing it. We've recorded about wow. 10 million swings. And we're actually using the research we did on the stack. This is really cool to drive our optimal head weights on our ping drivers because it's like a big scientific experiment. I mean, like with the, all the different weights and so with all like, the different oh, weights, they swing faster here. Let's we, make one like that. Exactly, man. Oh, so shit. we went in to figure out, okay, we're designing our next ladies product. How do they swing it? We went into the stack data and we're like, how sensitive are they to when we take off and add weight? Let's look at the juniors. Let's look at the older golfers, you know, and we create these different segments and we use that to optimize our head weights and our ping drivers. That's so wow. cool. So like for that, for the person listening at home, if they go pick the stack system up, like how much speed do you think they could gain in six months if they actually, you know, followed the app religiously and dedicated themselves to doing it? Yeah. And we're, 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 we're cool. Like we're very transparent, man. Like if you're already like doing a lot of things, mm -hmm. you know, your, 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 your odds of gaining the average amount of club head speed, which our user gains are going to be a little bit less because you're already doing a bunch of stuff. You know what I mean? Like Victor's already doing tons of stuff. He still got faster, but if you've never done speed training before, our average user is gaining six miles an hour in club head speed in six weeks. What does that relate to distance wise? Dude, so that's going to be like 15 to 20 yards yeah. depending on your wow. life conditions. 15 to 20 yards in six weeks. And then, and, and it's not like you have to do it every day. You actually get penalized in the app for doing it every day. You want to, it's like lifting weights, man. You don't want to do go bench press every day. You want to bench three times a week or two times a week. So the stack is like that. It's about a 15 to 20 minute workout and you do it every two to four days and the first program that everyone goes through takes six weeks and then after you do that you go through an, an assessment where you swing your driver and a bunch of the other weights the app will through ai which is kind of like having sasho's brain literally in the app mm -hmm. so the guy who coached fitzpatrick talking. literally in the app figures out the next program for you that you should do so like let's say one of the questions you ask is like man, I'm real strong. This would be like, like, like stallings. You know what I mean? It's like super strong, but maybe he lost speed. He lost that fast twitch fiber and he's been stacking. He would get a different program that would light up his fast twitch uh, muscle fibers where you might get a different program recommended in there, right? That's more heavy stuff. Like we call the heavy hitter, you know? Um, so yeah, it's got all these different programs in there that are driven through AI, you know, uh, which is sweet. That's sick. And it's not for like, you know, you mentioned Matt and Victor. Okay. They're different. Yeah. A lot of 99.9% .9 yeah. of the world ain't that, but it's for like, you could swing at 90. Like my dad could use it or yes. dude, you swing at 110. Like that's kind of where I hover. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's for every, there's still, no. you still gain. On. What's the most you've seen anyone? Oh man. This guy named Josh Axler. He, uh, he, he, he made, he made Fitzpatrick, uh, look like silly, man, dude. So this guy trained on it uh, for one year, followed the app. That's all he did, dude. He followed the app. He trained on it for one year. He gained 22 miles an hour of club head speed. Oh, my God. And he got better from, golf. From what to what? Where was he? He went from like around 100-ish or 105 that's to like geez. 130 from club speed. I mean, that's like going from your club championship, maybe championship flight guys that win at 105-ish, maybe yeah. somewhere in there, to 
top of the world. And he got better at golf, dude. His handicap went from like six to he became like a scratch yeah. golfer in that one year, obviously. He's in his 60 yards. Yeah, so Josh Axler, dude, this guy, is, this guy was amazing. But yeah, we have all age ranges using it. So we make like a junior one, so like three inches shorter. And it's because our, our hardware uh, goes from no weights on it, so it's like mega light, to 300 grams on it. So we have like Martin Borgmeier, longest hitter in the world, can use it as well. And so we have age ranges from like seven year olds, like juniors doing it, and they love it. They love the app and everything, follow it. And we have some 80 and 90 year olds doing it that are gaining speed. That's awesome. So it's like the hardware spans every every spectrum. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's pretty sweet. What'd you gain when you said you went from I, 2018 or whatever it was? You said, I'm not long enough, straight enough. I got to, if I want to play in major championships, I'm going to make, I want to hang around. I got to do that. How much did you get? What were you swinging at the time? And then now. At your peak. I, yeah, no, stack. I kind of maybe a little less than Fitzpatrick, but like my ball speed was like I couldn't get over 170. I was like 165 to 167 there in 2018. And then I trained and I bet when I was playing on the course there at Beth Page, I was I was high 170s. So a good 10 miles an hour in ball speed. Gamer ball speed. Yeah, too. gamer ball speed. That's different. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I could I could. uh kind of do long drivey type of techniques on the range and, and yeah. pump it up to 185 ball speed. But my playing ball speed, like your ceiling just goes up. You know what I mean? Uh, into the high 170s, which is a game changer out there. Well, I highly recommend Massive. it. And Sleaze, I mean, if you start it, maybe you can finally get rid of that silver medal and get a gold at the four ball. Can That's you guarantee me a non-runner up at the four ball? <laughs> I'll, you went, do, you I'll went, tattoo your logo right here on the dome piece. Let's do it. Done. That's verbal binding. Guaranteed yep. lock it in. Guaranteed dub. Like don't it. matter how many right. trannies I drink or any of that. You don't need any more of those silver medals. No, you got dude, enough of those. Low, I'm the tin man over here. <laughs> and all silver. I love it. Should we get to the E9 slays? Let's do some E9. I all might right. throw a couple little bonus balls in here on the E9 too. Yeah, I've, I've got uh, a couple as, as well. But uh, Marty, we ask this to everyone. You can trade lives with anyone for a day. Walk in their shoes. They can be dead, alive, but you get to be them for a day. Who would it be? And don't say Drew Stoltz. I expect ball. something interesting. Yeah, not me. Now, will that be a hell? Of, there's some good days. I, I know he's a controversial figure, but man, yes. e Elon Musk. Mm. Like because I, because I like I love the entrepreneurial side. I love the engineering side. Like my kids are all into like SpaceX. I've been to SpaceX. A bunch of us from team from Ping went over there to SpaceX. No shit. I'm just like it. I I own a Tesla. You know, I'm like all into the software updates and like. Uh, I know he's kind of a controversial figure in some other regards, but man, I would say like a, one day being him and working on like Tesla things, SpaceX things, business things would be like super fascinating. But what about the day when you have to fight Mark Zuckerberg? Exactly what I was getting to. Mount on that. <laughs> body Zuckerberg. <laughs> uh, you get the body Zuck. In the, in I the heard ring. that might be in the Coliseum. I heard, the rumors, <laughs> did you hear that? It could be fought in the Coliseum. I mean, wow. this would be... The pay per view numbers would be they can oh. solve world problems, and it'll be a bigger numbers. it'll be a bigger letdown than Mayweather Pacquiao. Without it'll be thirty <laughs> seconds of fury, and then both guys have been like, "Fuck it, I ain't got any left." I'm a billionaire. Unless I Elon's on some crazy, unless he can put a chip in his brain, that he well, he might tricks his he's body. He's got that. <laughs> I know that's what I'm saying. Um, okay, Elon Musk. I like that. First, Elon Musk. You might be not as smart as you are current day. That, is, that a, is that a factor? You I go don't know. backwards in intellect? That could happen. Okay, just think about that before you commit. Uh, all right, this one's for the listeners, and we kind of touched on it, but it might be a different answer. Game improvement question. One simple thing the average player out there could change in terms of their bag or their bag setup that would improve their game the most. Is it like, do you see too many guys playing blades when they shouldn't be? Is it, um, you know, you, their driver's too long or they need more hybrids like we talked about? Is there one thing you see constantly just with like a equipment change you could get better? Yeah, I came, I, my, my, my brain went to like, what are the most important clubs for scoring? And it's the driver number one and the putter number two. And so I, I would say driver, man, like just like you, uh, getting the right launch conditions on your driver. Like that's like getting the right ball speed, launch, spin, the right length, and max out your driver because that's going to matter. You hit, It's like the most important club for scoring. You hit it on nearly every hole, statistically, strokes gained, all that stuff, however you want to look at it, is like getting the right launch conditions in your driver. That's like the lowest hanging fruit. So like a proper fitting, basically. Proper With fitting, the, If man. you're going to do anything, make sure your driver's dialed. Get your driver dialed. 
get the most out okay, of it. Okay, I'll, I'll piggyback off that with my next one because I think a lot of people, they ask me, like, how important is the shaft in a driver? And, I, and it yeah. cracks me up because there'll be some shafts that are $100 and some that are $1,200. Like, for yeah. you, like, how important is the shaft and why are these things so expensive? Yeah, I mean, well, why are they expensive, man? The materials are expensive in shafts. So, like, to make, um, like, high modulus. One of the fun things about my job is I've been to literally probably almost every golf factory in the world, man. Nip on the mountains of Japan, carbon fiber, pre-preg places, all this stuff. And the manufacturing of the, the carbon fiber, like, the high modulus lightweight carbon fiber is super expensive. So, that's kind of why they're expensive. Shaft fitting is very important. Um it, but it's it's like a it's an individual thing to every golfer. Like the role of the shaft is to kind of uh is to deliver the right loft, like dynamic loft in the face conditions, and then you want to have the shaft respond to how you transition, like that change of direction. And like if you get the, if you get a shaft that's too weak for you, Drew, and you like yank on the handle hard. And it's going to be flopping around, dude. It's going to it's going to send your psychology crazy, and it's going to deliver erratically down at the bottom. So the whole secret to getting the right shaft is something that matches how you transition it, like your your uh, how you apply force and torque during the transition is like the secret sauce. And that's why you find players called that like play the same shaft for like the, like their whole career or the same style of shaft because they're they're tra they transition. They have a certain like signature yeah. going on there. So you want to kind of match that, and then you want to use it to control the face delivery uh, to either add a little bit of loft or take off a little bit of loft. And then you can use torque to make the face be delivered more open if you want to as well. So like, I, I the shafts are like super individual, um, and and it's uh it's not the number one driver of performance though. Like you want to focus on the head model first, tune the shaft to you, and to make little micro tweaks to the ball flight. Yeah, you, you mentioned that, how some guys just stick with the same one. I believe John Rom just switched for the first time in like 15 years. He played the really? same one forever. And also, Sleaze is known as a yanker of the shaft. There's many things I do well, not <laughs> many better than yanking <laughs> the shaft. But. I get the right fitting, man. Yanking the shaft, ball striking. Kind of go hand in hand. You with me? A little pun there. We're rolling nice, <laughs> nicely on this. You want to add one? You want to throw one in? I'm out. I will give you a chance. This is impressive. This uh, is uh, 8.43 in Scottsdale time, and we're firing pretty good. And the brain's already firing. <laughs> it's it's crazy. I'm it's all the, levered up right where I belong. It's that accelerator you're drinking. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to go stack until my heart explodes. I'm going to hit seeds by the time you get back. Um, I'm interested in this right here. We won't give you all equipment questions, but this is cool. All right. There's someone comes to you. You have zero rules that you have to abide by. Cost is a non-factor. You can have whatever material of anything that's available in the world that you want. And your whole job is to make an illegal driver that goes as far as humanly possible. And I'll use you as the comp since we've been talking about your game. How much distance could you gain if you could build yourself the most illegal driver in the world? This is a fun question, man. I think... And will you do that? And can I have one? Uh, oh, geez, man. Okay, so... How to do it? I think it, I think the boundaries would be: Could you bring in any outside energy? You know what I mean? Like, no, I don't have any idea what that means. <laughs> no, that means <laughs> no. could you prime the driver, man? Could you could you put like a explosive in it? Oh, dynamite in the driver. If you, I mean, do if that, it doesn't man, kill you, you can do it. You can do whatever you want. I'm just saying, build me the longest club. That's that what I would play. do. I would make something Shit, yeah. that you could put in there and prime it. That would right when right when you got like down to like p6 you're coming into p7 into impact shafts parallel to the ground this explosive goes off on the back of the driver makes it like a miniature rocket or jet flies right in there that ball will go a mile usga would love that that's not what i was expecting i was like well i need this this material that only nasa can get access to i didn't expect an exploding explosive driver well that would be sick though exactly that would sell all right, all right. next one um ping has been a great supporter of the college and amateur game Give us, in your opinion, a future star we're going to see in the game of professional golf that's obviously not out there yet. Oh, man, that's a great one. Mm, we got him thinking. 
You I got think, one. Well, I mean, my mind is my mind is on. Uh, well, I know he just turned pro, but man, Sam Bennett. He plays really good in professional events. I mean, it was it was it's hard for me to kind of go past that uh, because he's so impressive. Like he it, that he's he he plays good in those big events. Like he shows up when it matters. I'm I'm very impressed by that. And hard golf courses. And hard golf Seems courses. Seems to love that. Yeah, so he's, he he thrives on that, and he kind of goes against the odds. You know what I mean? Uh, and that's why I think I would I'm I'm very bullish on him uh, going forward. He's got that dog. He yeah. does have the dog exactly, but he doesn't like look at his swing on video, Colt. He doesn't know how fast he's. He doesn't all the stuff that everyone he's, knows everything about. Maybe too much about. He's like, no, nah, I don't even do. If I just want my ball to do this, which that, I love. Yeah, and that's why my mind that's why my mind went to him because he's kind of the anti. He's like anti the anti. Day. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on him. Okay. I like There's it. Some good Incredible ones up club. In the AM side. Incredible club twirl. Sam Bennett. Yeah. True. True. Stands over it a bit long. We'll get to that. Could tighten that up just a fraction, but he's playing damn good. He plays good in professional events. Okay. Hypothetical here. And we're talking about the ball rollback. I'm going to take it a little bit more. If the world, assuming the golf world starting today, bam, you better go back. Persimmon and Bellotta. It's capped right there. Whatever the peak of Persimmon Bellotta was, does the top 10 in the world golf rankings change? And if so, how? Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, I think what we, a little bit of what we talked about earlier is uh, you wouldn't, you, you could have uh, shorter players that were more artistic uh, thrive more uh, with, with the Persimmon and Bellotta. So you're saying Persimmon and Bellotta combo? You think the crooked, the longer, like crooked is a Bellotta, now it spins more. If you're a guy that's, I'm long, but I'm not super accurate. Now those misses become even Yeah, I think it would be more like my brain goes to like a Nick Faldo archetype of player, like would thrive a little bit more with that type of, uh, with the constraint of, 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 uh, Persimmon and Bellotta. Like there'd be more of a premium on shot making, shaping, controlling your ball flight, the wind, like playing in the wind becomes like a way bigger premium and there's wind on freaking every shot. So, so being able to, to manipulate your trajectory, control your trajectory, di the, the premium on distance would be toned back a little bit. It would still be important, but it'd be toned back slightly compared to the modern game. And that's so there'd be a good shakeup. And that's why, like, I mean, I say like Tiger, in my opinion, Tiger's the greatest to ever play. But I think technology hurt him. It brought the rest of the players closer to him. Like he was so far past everyone else. If the technology would have, you know, been, stayed what it was 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think you could look at Nicholas in a similar light, right? Um, as 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 Tiger. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, you know, they put all these the, the, those kind of things in there, and some of the technology caught up. And and Tiger was a late adopter to some of those things. Yeah, like he was he, steel shaft for for long when dudes were dude, graphite. He was steel shaft PT ninety three wood, which is the most impossible club to hit on planet yeah. Earth. Yeah, he 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 was a late adopter to that. He was a late adopter to the you know on the ball change a little bit. I mean, even well when he played Riv this year, he played the Tour BX ball from the Tour BXS, which is a ball you could curve more, and he loved it. Yeah, you know what I mean. So he was even a late adopter of that, and he he was bombing it out there, obviously. Yeah, okay. I'm with Colt. If it, if they changed, if they never changed it, he'd won everything. Say what? He pretty much did. <laughs> but yeah. All right. This is my last. <laughs> well, yeah. This is my last one. Um, what would your response and you know the Solheim family at Ping? You know, you you take care of this young kid all through college. He gets out there. He's on the Jicky Jacks. He makes this appearance in his first PGA Tour event. And he takes a check for five thousand dollars to switch to a different driver and hybrid. What would the people at Ping think of that? <laughs> I can tell you what they thought of it. <laughs> Just in this hypothetical. <laughs> Just say it never on that. happened. <laughs> Do you even know that story? No. Oh god. Yeah, I don't know if he knew because he's not he's in there building the shit. Who is this guy? It was this legendary dude back in the day. A lot of hype. A lot of hype. A lot of speed. A lot of swag out of this kid. But he just never really was getting his opportunity. And finally gets his way through a Monday down in Mayakoba. And he's known for driving the ball straight, not the longest. However, at the time, in the race for arms, there were some manufacturers offering big cash, dude. Huge cash. Game changer cash. 5K. Just to change out all the head covers in your bag for the week for the little survey or whatever. And, you know. Some guys have off the course issues, things they got to handle. They need that money. And the guy took it and then drove it into the fucking mangroves more than any guy to ever play that John golf course. 100. I went from 14 fairways in the Monday, straightest driver in history, to just where you think, right here? Drop right here? 
Did it How, cross? How'd that turn out for you? I, I had Sevi Ballesteros could not have squeezed a better <laughs> score out of round one than I did. I think <laughs> it was up and downs from bunkers. I mean, just, if, you know, for bogeys, it was just, it didn't work out well, but. Great choice. Good question, but uh, they, well, don't, they don't like it. I well, just there's summarize. a reason we're the most played driver by non-staff players on the PGA Tour. Okay. Yeah. I mean, maybe those guys uh, out there learn their lesson. Maybe they're not obvi- they're obviously not offering five K to play some other stuff right now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Times have changed, inflation, all that shit. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. Here we go. Uh, this question's been done, but this is specifically to ping players, in your opinion. Okay, build your ultimate ping player modern day. You got your pick me a ping guy. This is your dr- t ball, your driver. Yeah, your, your best iron player, your best wedge player, short game player, putter. Go through. You're building the ultimate guy. Uh, let's see. Driver, start. Start with the okay. driver, man. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's recency bias, but like modern day Victor, maybe. Modern day Victor. Victor Tony would be. The t- yeah, Tony. Yeah, but Tony's up there too, man. That camp Victor, champ fellow hits it pretty far. Yeah. Yeah, he hits it really far, man. Um, so I'd say modern day Victor, camp champs up there. Okay. Iron player. Man, Corey Connors, man. Mm, Might not be the flashiest guy. I forgot guy. about Corey. I was going to say Tyrrell. Dude, for Tyrrell, sure. Yeah, Tyrrell's proximity to the hole with his irons is is quite phenomenal. He's, I mean, they're darts. Yeah, Hunter's a tough one, too. Okay, so I got to go But driver. modern day, because Hunter would be like... Okay, so modern player. day. Yeah. I would go Victor on the on the tee ball. Okay. I would go Corey Connors for iron play. Um, What's next? Wedge now, play? I, wedges, if you want to morph wedges in short game, you can. Man, Tyrrell. Mm. Tyr- Tyrrell. Tyrrell stuffs the wedges. And his short game's crafty. But, I, you know, him and Louie. Louis, you know, Louie's still playing a little bit. Yeah. I don't know if he's... We, we kind of can Got count him Louis in Got Louie for the first two categories for a while, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then putter. I couldn't come up with a putter. Dude, so putter, actually, I'm going to go... Like, I Tyrrell's Tyr- putting stats are, are good. So... um I think we can go. McKenzie's uh, pretty good putter. Yeah, Mac is a great putter, man. I would go. I would probably go Mac. Yeah, that'd that was be, that'd be a good one for the, the one I had. I would go Mac. You like that squad? Would you change any of that, Colt? I just I would take Top. Terrell and everything just because I love him. Dude, same. Is it same? Do you have to spend extra time designing special Terrell clubs that are unbreakable and, <laughs> uh, and react better to throwing? <laughs> Is, yes, that, is that a lot of do. your time? Yeah, about 50%. Here's our normal 430. We got you one. Yeah, this, this, made the wall thickness yeah, is a it's little... It's bulletproof. Yeah, it's a little heavier. He's the best. <laughs> exactly. I, He's such a, yeah, but, such a beast. I love him. All right, you got any more well, Marty. Uh, That's it, dude. I'm going to go stack my ass off and start hitting Let's stack. seeds. Yeah, we're going to. Seriously, for everyone listening, if you haven't checked it out, you want to get longer. This system, rave reviews from everybody that's out there that's been using it. It works. Major champions, all that. Got the smartest guy in the biz behind it. Um, Marty, thank you so much for coming in, dude. We know you're a busy, busy man. Keep up the great work. Keep designing great shit. And uh, you promised me a gold medal, so I'll be in touch. That's right. We'll see you next year after you get it. Done. You got thanks, it. Marty. Right, Marty thanks, Marty. Marty Jertson. Thanks for having me, boys. Appreciate you, brother. It was fun. All right. Well, that was Marty Jertson joining us on Subpar. Fascinating stuff. I mean, the things these, these club companies come up with. Uh, I'm glad there's a lot more smarter people out in the world than you and i slays more smarter couldn't more smarter that's yeah couldn't have, gotta... smart, that couldn't have been could not have been said better luckily there's a more smarter people out there mm-hmm. than marty's one of i did not expect the like exploding driver when i said build the longest driver possible what would you do that's some different type of shit but this dude's just like not only is he like one of the smartest guys in golf but dude he's really good like really good. Yeah, he, a can lot play. Of section events. he gets into that Vegas event a lot for winning the section stuff down here, played in what six major championships. Like the guy, the guy can go for a guy that holds like a real job, a big job, and then also going out there and trying to compete. You know, he's played weekends and stuff like that. Um, his play his caliber of play is spectacular for a guy that's also a certified genius. And good to know that uh well, it's actually unfortunate for you that since you dump ping and on your only PGA tour event. Um, huh. They were rather disappointed, but good news is their company has rebounded just fine. They bounced back from that, which is good. Stock plummeted immediately after they took that survey down there. It says Sleaze ain't playing ping, but Marty, maybe while you're designing all these clubs, you design some sort of a rocket ship that can get the truck from Phoenix to Mayakoba for future reference. We won't run into this issue, this issue but I would have $5,000 less to my name. So oh, it worked you- out really nicely for me. 
I think even back in those days, if you made the cut and finished last, you made at least 10. So true. Good point. I would have won. It would have changed the whole like the, the butterfly effect of me not switching to that other company that week. Oh my God. Could you imagine? Well, that was a lot of fun, but I suggest you stick to just trying to pick winners instead of winning PGA Tour events. I'm doing been, that, baby. I'm you've doing been that. on a pretty good heater. It's been impressive, and it's time to tee it up on FanDuel this PGA Tour season. Right now, FanDuel is giving new customers 10 times your first bet in bonus bets up to $200. It doesn't matter if your first bet is a bogey. Bet $20 and get $2,000 in bonus bets, win or lose. We're on to the John Deere Classic. We can do some parlays. Outright winners, top 10s, top 20s, head-to-head matchups, whatever you want. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the golf action. And when you win, you get paid instantly, which you've been following the sleeves lately. You're making a lot of money. So let's see if you can stay hot up at the John Deere Classic, also known for the Duck City Bistro, which I will be at every night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Not going to tell you time or exactly where it's located because I'm afraid some of you will show up. But it's open tab. He wants to say that. Nope. Show up. He's got it handled. That's very nice of you. You said that off air. I thought that was generous. All right. Well, let's get to it. My favorite, he's a little bit down the board, but I think his time is coming. He's been playing some really consistent golf. He's had several chances. I know he loves this golf course. It'll be a birdie fest. He's got one of the worst names in golf for to be a professional golfer. I'm going Adam Shank. Okay. The Purdue like Boilermaker. A couple of Boilermakers right. over here. That's right. A couple of Boilermakers. Uh, he's been playing good. He can get going really nicely when he gets going. He's a little down the board, but I don't hate that pick whatsoever. I'm going here, Colt, to going to some friendly, familiar terrain here with my favorite, which is interesting because we've been picking this guy, except we've been picking him as our dark horse for the last couple of weeks, and he has quickly moved into the favorite category. Give me Ludwig Aberg this week, all right? We know all about him, his college career, he's a stud, two-time Hogan Award winner, all that. He showed up this week at the Rocket, incredible first couple rounds, was right there in the mix. Had a tough weekend, 73-72 after being in contention, but in three events as a pro, hasn't missed the cut. He finished outside the top 25 this past week with that weekend, but he's only shot one round over 73 during that time. Could not be higher on a young guy than I am on Ludwig, so why not now? Yeah, I had his... I had his group on Saturday, him and Ricky Fowler. That was the first time I ever got to really see it up close and personal. Talk to him. Such a nice kid. Um, he's actually staying in Lubbock for the time being right now. He was recruited by two schools. So he's and I got a little heat on this for the broadcast, but he was recruited by Texas Tech and Arizona State. I want to know what happened on that recruiting visit to Texas Tech that convinced him to go there. Yeah, Whatever it was, it worked. They might have flown him into L.A. and been like, you like Lubbock? Pretty cool, huh? Just sign here. <laughs> Tempe, Tempe and Lubbock. Shout out to Lubbock. I got some friends out there. I ain't gonna hate on them, but Tempe, just I don't know. If you get on if you get on campus, that's a tough sell. So shout out to Sands for selling Lubbock. You're getting the best damn college player we've seen in a long time. But this dude's a monster. How good was how good is he off the tee? It's a joke. Everything. How good is he off the tee? Yeah, he just had a rough stretch there on the back night on Saturday. Um, he kind of unraveled a little bit, but he he's got it, man. It's impressive to see even Ricky Fowler. We're, Walking up the fairway, and I was like, this kid's pretty damn good. He's like, yeah, he's going to be just fine. Yeah, look out for him on the European Ryder Cup team, too. Very, very. Oh, I got, by the way, since we are on the gambling segment, I got a friend of mine before last week to give me five to one odds on Ludwig making the European Ryder Cup team. You like my side? You're on the yes side? I'm saying he's going to do it. I love that side. You go, go look at their 11 through 14, 15 and say, tell me something about these guys. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know what I mean? Right. And, and I take Ludwig in a heart. I put him on the team right now. All right. My uh my dark horse this week. I just love this man. It's the John Deere farming equipment. This guy kind of looks like a farmer, so I feel like it just fits. He's pretty far down the board, but one of my favorite podcast guests we have had, Homeless Hubs, Mark Hubbard. Let's do it. Love the hubs. Love the man. Bring that stinky pinky out there to Moline. <laughs> the people will embrace that thing, hubs. Do not be afraid. One of our favorite guests. We will have him back shortly, hopefully after he wins this week. I'm going to a guy called, doesn't necessarily look like a farmer, okay? But he's starting to play a little bit. Uh, he's starting to round back into form here. I'm going Ches Reeve, okay? So if you look at his last three, 25th, he finished fourth, and then 29th. Those are his last three. But he's been shooting some low, low scores, which is what you're going to need to do this past week. He's got four rounds of 65 or lower in his last eight, eight, excuse me, eight rounds. So in his last two weeks, he's going to need it this week, like I said. 
When he gets going, he can really go. Give me Chaz Reedy down the board. Well, the people around Westbrook call him Kenny. You know, it's Chaz, Kenny Chesney. I'm sure Kenny's got a song about a farm. There's makes no sense. Question. No question. That's our looked, logic for gambling. He looked proper on that tractor, too. All right. So aim for some green and bet on the PGA Tour. Go to FanDuel.com slash subpar and sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash subpar to 10-time your first bet up to $200 now. FanDuel, official betting operator of the PGA Tour. Must be 21 years and older and present in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 deposit required. Refund issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hope is here. Gambling helpline MA.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. Call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. That's 467-369 in New York. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, or Virginia. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana or www.mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland, 1-800-F-522-4700 in Wyoming or visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia. My man Sleaze, have a great 4th of July. Same to everyone out there listening. We'll talk to you on the next subpar.